All right, thank you, everyone. Over to you, Michelle. In a mana, in a reo, ira rangatira ma, na mihi mana ho kia koto, ko Michelle Imblinga ho, tena koto katoa. Today we are a step closer towards delivering climate-related disclosures for Aotearoa New Zealand. Over 500 people registered for today's session, and I'd like to start by thanking you for being part of this important journey. I'm extremely proud of our XRB team and getting our work to this point, and I'm thrilled that you, you will get to meet some of them today. I'd also like to acknowledge the generous input and advice we have received from a wide range of individuals and organizations that have helped to shape our thinking and our work. The consultation documents we are launching today is focused on the strategy, metrics and targets disclosures. These are challenging but critical topics that for most organizations will require a range of new processes to be developed and implemented. Added to this is the need for entities to wrap their heads around how to understand their current risks, opportunities and financial implications and challenge themselves to imagine different futures and how they might influence the creation and maintenance of enterprise value. We understand that this is a significant undertaking for organisations and while these disclosures are intended to be ambitious and forward-looking, we are realistic that reporting entities are embarking on a journey and so no one is expecting perfection on day one. Our aim in developing these disclosures is to provide a clear and consistent path for reporting entities to follow as they mature, innovate, and improve their reporting over time. We acknowledge that there is a lot of material to digest, both in the consultation document itself and in the accompanying documents that compares the proposals against international requirements and developments. So our launch today will provide you with a brief overview of key sections of the consultation document and starting next week a series of deep line on deep dive online events will be held which will be an opportunity for you to ask questions directly of the XRB's climate team. And now I'd like to hand it back to Amelia Sharman, our Director of Climate Reporting, who will facilitate today's session. Thank you Michelle. First, I would like to do a quick recap of some of the main aspects of the climate related disclosure framework to provide some useful context for today's presentation. First, who is required to report and by when? Approximately 200 climate reporting entities are part of this regime as designated in legislation. They're either large listed debt or equity issuers or large financial organizations ranging from banks to managers of registered investment schemes. The XRB sets the rules for reporting, but we do not determine whether an entity is in or out. If there is any uncertainty over whether an entity is a designated climate reporting entity or not, we recommend getting some independent legal advice, and if there is any remaining uncertainty, speaking with the Financial Markets Authority. Currently, we're anticipating issuing a standard by December 2022. This means that entities will be required to disclose according to the standard for accounting periods that start on or after 1 January 2023. For example, for a reporting entity with a 31 March balance date as shown here, they would be required to prepare their first climate statement as part of their 31 March 2024 reporting. And mandatory assurance for GHG emissions disclosures would kick in for their second climate statement. One thing to note here is that we are not requiring comparative information to be included in the entity's first climate statement. Comparative information will be required from the second climate statement onwards. And to simplify the reporting framework, we now propose that it will comprise three standards rather than including any authoritative notices. NZCS1 will contain the disclosure requirements, relating to the four thematic sections. So that's governance, risk management, strategy, and metrics and targets. NZCS2 contains the first time adoption provisions available to climate reporting entities the first time that they are required to disclose. And NZCS3 contains the general requirements for preparers to follow in assisting them to make disclosures under Aotearoa New Zealand climate standards. Note that the three standards have mandatory status, but that alongside the standards, the XRB will issue non-mandatory guidance 
for entities to refer to when making their disclosures. This will lead to consistent application of the standard and therefore result in useful and comparable information. While we have been busy working on our proposed disclosures, there have been a lot of important global developments that my colleagues later on in this presentation will refer to. I'd like to highlight three key developments up front. First, in October last year, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures put out a series of updated guidance material. Particularly relevant was the updated guidance on metrics, targets and transition plans, and the general implementation guidance. Second, a technical readiness working group to the IFRS Foundation published a prototype climate-related disclosure standard. This prototype was developed to give the new International Sustainability Standards Board a running start in its work to develop an internationally relevant climate reporting standard. We expect an exposure draft of this climate standard from the new International Sustainability Standards Board any day now and understand that they are looking to publish their final standard also in December 2022. Our team is staying on top of global and domestic reporting requirements as we continue our work and we are in close contact with the people involved with the International Sustainability Standards Board. To assist uh, preparers, we have also produced a comparison document comparing our proposed disclosures with both the TCFD guidance and the Technical Readiness Working Group prototype. This is on our website alongside the consultation document. We consider that there is broad consistency between the TCFD recommendations, the prototype and our proposed disclosures. And lastly from me, just a quick overview of the timeline. We consulted in October on governance and risk management and published a feedback document on that consultation last month. The overall approach taken by the XRB received strong support, particularly the principles-based approach and close alignment with the TCFD. Now we're asking for submissions on the other two main sections of NZCS1, the strategy and metrics and targets disclosures. We welcome submissions in any form. As Michelle said, we're running a series of deep dive events where we will delve into the detail of the disclosures and open the floor to Q&A. That feedback received will inform the full exposure draft that will be issued in July, and we are continuing to aim to issue the full set of standards and guidance in December 2022. Now, onto the main part of the presentation, the proposed disclosures. To speak about the strategy disclosures, we have Jack Bissett, Policy Manager, Climate and Sustainability. Over to you, Jack. Thanks, Amelia. Kia ora koutou. This section of the presentation outlines our proposed strategy disclosures. First thing I'd say is that the strategy section is about your strategy. It's about what your entity is trying to achieve. This is not about having a separate climate strategy. It's about how climate change will affect what you're trying to achieve and what you're doing in response to that. This slide gives you an overview of the whole strategy section. Strategy is quite clearly the broader section of the whole standard in terms of how much ground entities will need to cover. We have proposed first time adoption provisions to reflect this to allow lead in time on some disclosures. The objective of this section, summarized in the green box, is to enable primary users to understand how strategy is being impacted by climate change across the various dimensions listed there. The first three disclosures listed in the gray box should be relatively familiar. They effectively align with the TCFD's three recommended strategy disclosures. A key decision we have made has been to add the fourth disclosure on methodologies and assumptions relating to scenario analysis. This draws directly from TCFD guidance and is broadly in line with the direction of travel of the Technical Readiness Working Group. In the next three slides, I'll highlight some of the important concepts that are included in the strategy section. So firstly, what are climate related risks and opportunities? Transition risks and opportunities on the top arise due to the transition to a lower emissions global and domestic economy across those different dimensions listed there. Physical risks and opportunities arise due to the physical impacts of climate change. These are often categorized as event-driven or acute, such as increased severity of extreme weather events, and secondly, longer term or chronic shifts in precipitation, temperature, and increased variability in weather patterns. We would expect these risks and opportunities to be disclosed in a way that is specific to the entity 
in more detail than they appear here. Next, what are transition and adaptation plans? A transition plan is the aspect of an entity's overall strategy that lays out a set of targets and actions supporting its transition toward a low emissions economy. So it includes actions such as reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also beyond that to include actions such as the development of new low emissions goods and services. An adaptation plan is the aspect of an entity's overall strategy that lays out how an entity aims to minimize risks and capture opportunities associated with physical climate changes. The TCFD's recently updated guidance now more explicitly addresses the disclosure of these transition and adaptation plans. This is because primary users are increasingly seeing them as core parts of an organization's overall business strategy, as illustrated here. As I said earlier, this is not about having separate disconnected plans. This is about the overall business strategy. The TCFD recently conducted a survey asking primary users whether they thought information on transition plans was useful. 96% of users responded that organizations disclosure of transition plans would be very useful or somewhat useful. The key decision we have made is to require the disclosure of transition and adaptation plans. We've proposed first time adoption provisions in this area. We're proposing to allow until the second climate statement until transition plans need to be disclosed and allowing until the third climate statement for adaptation plans. Next, what is scenario analysis? Scenario analysis is a process for systematically exploring the effects of a range of plausible future events under conditions of uncertainty. The purpose of scenario analysis in this context is about testing the resilience of the entity's business model and strategy to plausible climate futures. Having regard for this why is extremely important. The proposed strategy section requires entities to describe the details of the scenario analysis that, have, that has been undertaken. We would encourage you to look, at our, look out for, uh, for our proposed definitions. The terms scenario analysis and climate related scenarios are very important and also have a look for our two page fact sheet explaining these foundations on scenario analysis further. A key decision we have made on scenario analysis is we've proposed to align with the TCFD and the technical readiness working group by requiring that disclosure is made in relation to, at a minimum, a 1.5 degree scenario and a greater than two degrees scenario. The XRB has also spent the last few months engaging with sectors to encourage entities to start on scenario analysis at a sector level. Many sectors are already doing so and further sectors continue to start collaborative projects. We're very excited about these developments and we would encourage you to stay across what's happening in your sector. Namahinui, Amelia, back to you. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, and now to talk about the metrics and targets disclosures, please welcome Judy Ryan, Technical Advisor, GHG Emissions. Namahi Amelia, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, so this section, I'll cover the summary requirements and the decisions we made to get to our proposed standard. So disclosing metrics and targets information allows primary users to better assess the organization's potential risk adjusted returns, general exposure to climate related issues and progress in managing or adapting to those issues. So our proposed standard has three sections, metrics, targets, and methodologies and assumptions. With balanced principles-based disclosures, providing flexibility for entities, along with prescriptive disclosures that provide comparability, uh, particularly in the cross-industry metrics section. When drafting the metrics and targets section, we've begun with the TCFD as a base and included the most recent guidance. And our proposed section is, remains closely aligned with TCFD recommended disclosures. The eight proposed eight cross-industry metrics have been drawn from the TCFD and they are also aligned with those proposed by the working group. We are not proposing to specify industry-specific metrics as we consider that entities should report those metrics which they actually use for management purposes. We believe there is limited value for an entity in having to report metrics which are not used for management purposes. The TCFD implementation guidance provides recommended industry specific metrics and the working group has proposed an extensive list drawn from SASB standards. 
We've provided information on both of these sources in our consultation document. We've proposed a separate subsection for the disclosure of methodologies and assumptions used by the entity to calculate its metrics and targets. This is important information to help users understand how an entity has calculated the disclosed metrics. We have required disclosure of scope three value chain emissions for all entities. These are the yellow arrows in this diagram. For most entities, this is where the most significant emissions risks and opportunities lie, and it is important for entities and primary users to understand these risks and opportunities. This stance is supported by our advisory panel and most of the feedback we've received from our first consultation. The Carbon Disclosure Project's analysis indicates that most companies' scope 3 emissions are on average 11 and a half times higher than their direct emissions. For financial institutions, portfolio emissions are on average 700 times higher than their direct emissions. The decision to include these scope 3 emissions is in alignment with both TCFD and TRWG, the working group. We've proposed additional disclosure requirements for greenhouse gas emissions. These disclosures are subject to assurance under our regime and some of our additional requirements are to enable this. We've also been more specific around disclosures to ensure greater comparability for primary users. We recognise that there are existing globally accepted and commonly used greenhouse gas emissions measurement and reporting standards, including the GHG protocol and ISO 14064. Therefore, we're not proposing to mandate a single approach but instead proposed that entities disclose the standards, protocols and methodologies they used. The emissions disclosures are required to be assured under the Act and for an assurance opinion to be formed over the disclosed emissions, the information will need to be prepared and reported in accordance with suitable measurement criteria. This means a greenhouse gas emissions report will need to be prepared in accordance with a generally accepted methodology to support the emissions disclosures in the climate statement. Our proposal is for an entity to prepare a greenhouse gas emissions report. This emissions report would be an integral part of the disclosures, would be required to be publicly available and would be subject to assurance. There will be more specific information on the assurance later in this presentation. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Judy. And now over to Lisa Kelsey, Senior Project Manager, Climate Standards, to talk to us about the proposed materiality disclosures. Thank you, Amelia, and kia ora. In this section, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the concept of materiality and why it is so important. I'm gonna share with you our proposed materiality definition and give you an overview of our proposed key requirements in relation to materiality. Firstly, what is the concept of materiality? Entities can apply the concept of materiality in a range of contexts. For example, to prioritize risks, understand impacts, make internal decisions, develop strategic direction, and set key performance indicators. In the context of reporting, whether financial or non-financial, materiality is a user and purpose-based judgment about what information is relevant. That is, whether providing or withholding information is likely to influence primary users' decision-making. So why is materiality so important? Effective application of the concept of materiality leads to the disclosure of relevant, entity-specific, decision-useful information. It is important because we want to avoid entities providing generic or boilerplate disclosures. We want entities disclosing relevant information. And we do not want this relevant information obscured by the inclusion of insignificant detail. Now let's look at the proposed materiality definition. In the consultation paper, we have provided a proposed definition of materiality as shown on this slide, and also a proposed section containing materiality requirements. The proposed materiality definition and the proposed section will be part of our general requirement standard NZCS3. NZCS3 will also include other overarching requirements, such as requirements in relation, relation to providing comparative information. We have spent a lot of time discussing materiality 
and agreeing a proposed decision. We are comfortable that our proposals align with the TCFD recommendations and are appropriate for this stage of Aotearoa New Zealand's climate reporting journey. Our proposed materiality definition focuses on the primary users and the decisions they are making. Our proposed primary users are defined as existing and potential investors, lenders and other creditors. Our proposed definition focuses on information needed to make assessments of enterprise value. The term enterprise value is adopted and used internationally. Our proposals align with this international definition. We also highlight the importance of considering the long term when making materiality judgments. Now let's look at some of the proposed requirements in relation to materiality. As I mentioned, the proposed materiality section is included, included in the consultation document. I will just highlight some key proposals. One of the key points to note is that material information could include information about an entity's impacts on the climate if those impacts could reasonably be expected to affect the entity's enterprise value. For example, if an entity has a significant negative impact on climate change, this may negatively impact its enterprise value due to subsequent regulatory action or social pressure. We do not, in our proposed section, provide a uniform quantity threshold or predetermine what could be material in a particular situation. It is important to note that materiality judgments will vary for each entity and all disclosures are subject to materiality judgments. The disclosures in the standard are your starting point for materiality judgments. They are presumed to be material, but an entity need not disclose if it determines information would not be material relating to its own specific facts and circumstances. It is important to note that an entity assesses whether information is material in the context of the climate statement as a whole. The proposed disclosure objectives in the climate standard are to assist entities in making materiality judgments. This means an entity may in some cases need to provide additional information if they consider it as material to their primary users. That is it for materiality. I will now hand back to you, Amelia. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and now over to Misha Peters, Director Auditing and Assurance, to talk to us about the assurance requirements. Hi, thank you, Amelia, and kia ora, everybody. From an assurance perspective, I want to cover two aspects today. The first being what has to be assured, and secondly, the level of that assurance. So in the first instance, what needs to be assured? Well, this is a little bit of a recap of, of some of the concepts that Judy touched on previously. Greenhouse gas emissions are the subject of the mandatory assurance. So under the Act, it, it specifically relates to the greenhouse gas emission disclosures. The Act also says that that assurance engagement must be undertaken in accordance with XRB's assurance standards. So the assurance team at the XRB is currently working on a project to determine what those assurance requirements will be. And more information about that assurance project is available up on our website. The other point just to recap is from Amelia's timeline slide. So you will recall that assurance will be um, required for accounting periods ending from October 2024. And we expect that all climate reporting entities will publish at least one climate statement before mandatory assurance is required. The proposed disclosure requirements that relate to greenhouse gas emissions and are therefore required to be assured are covered by the masses bulleted on the slide. Summary, that's the scope one, two and three emissions, as well as those additional uh, disclosure requirements, for example, that consolidation approach. As mentioned by Judy, there's also this requirement to prepare a greenhouse gas emissions report and provide a link or cross-reference to that report together with confirmation that the greenhouse gas disclosures have been drawn from that report. 
Proposed NZCS1 is a disclosure standard rather than a measurement standard. And this is where the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report plays a very important role. For an assurance opinion to be formed over those disclosures, the information needs to be prepared and reported in accordance with suitable measurement criteria. And Judy referred to some of those methodologies previously. The Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report will, will therefore be prepared in accordance with that methodology, and that supports both the disclosures and the assurance engagement. Next, I wanna look at the level of assurance. So there are two levels of assurance. The, the highest level being reasonable assurance, and less than that is limited assurance. What does it mean and what, how will users distinguish the difference? For users reading an assurance report, reasonable assurance is stated in the positive. So a typical assurance conclusion will read, in my opinion, the greenhouse gas emissions are fairly presented in all material respects. For users reading a limited assurance report, the conclusion is stated in the negative. Nothing has come to my attention. It would indicate that those greenhouse gas emissions are not fairly stated. So that's the difference and those are the possibilities. The XRB is proposing to specify the minimum required level of assurance as part of the climate related disclosure framework. And based on our research of market practice to date, we've noticed that for entities that currently report and seek assurance over their greenhouse gas emissions, that there's a range of assurance being provided. Informed by this outreach undertaken so far, and in conjunction with further engagement with our stakeholders, the XRB considers that in these early days, and depending on the circumstances of the entity, it might be too early to mandate reasonable assurance, especially in light of the disclosure requirements that include all scope three emissions. So in the first instance, the XRB is proposing that at a minimum, limited assurance is sought over the greenhouse gas emissions, but that that level of assurance should be revisited after a suitable period. We note that some entities may voluntarily seek reasonable assurance over some or all of the greenhouse gas emission disclosures. And therefore for users, you might actually seek you might actually see different opinions, including both the positive and the negative conclusions that I referenced previously. The XRB expect both this move from limited to reasonable assurance to occur over time. And not only do we expect that to go from limited to reasonable, we also anticipate that the matters that are subject to assurance will also expand over time to eventually potentially cover the entire climate statement. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. And just to note, thank you very much for the questions that have come through in the Q&A. We're not doing Q&A today, but we've noted all those questions and we will address them in our deep dives uh, and in our other communications material. But now over to April McKenzie, Chief Executive of the XRB. Thank you, Amelia. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, Amelia, I was just going to comment on that very thing about the questions. Really appreciate the questions. So do please um, write them down there in the Q&A and we will make sure that they are answered. Uh, in the interest of time, we thought we would uh, introduce you to the material and then um, uh, move forward in a slightly different format. And I'll mention that again um, shortly. So uh, thank you to the climate team for providing a succinct and useful overview of uh, what's in the consultation document. Uh, to close out, I'd like to circle back on a commitment that the external reporting board made right at the very start of this work, back uh, in 2020. Uh, that's when the government announced its intention to introduce mandatory climate related disclosures. We said we had, we have, and we've continued to say that developing the disclosures would be done with you, not to you, not to reporting uh, entities, but with reporting entities. Our commitment to this is absolutely unwavering, and we're extremely pleased 
uh, with the level of interest and engagement that we have had from a broad range of stakeholders. So thanks to you out there on today's session uh, for participating and engaging with us. Um, that makes the, the quality of our product um, significantly enhanced. Our aim is for this to continue, this engagement, this working with you to continue and to grow. So your input and feedback are paramount. Now, uh, thank you for, again, the questions and I see those growing, that's great. Now there's a lot of detail to digest in this latest batch of material, this consultation document. So to help you get your heads around it, and as was mentioned right back at the beginning, um, we have planned a series of deep dives on each topic. And I encourage you to attend these and to share the event details with your colleagues. Uh, we've also produced a document called At a Glance. So uh, that's an at a glance version, a much sh shorter version of the consultation document, only runs for three or four pages. Now, this is a great way for you to get your directors, uh, the chairs of your boards, your chief executive engaged, aware and involved, because we know they won't read the lengthy consultation document, but at a glance will give them a sense for what you're tackling. Ultimately, Developing the disclosures is a collaborative effort. So two will be the task of implementing it. So uh, don't fear that as we progress rapidly to December 2022, when we issue the standard, uh, our work at the XRB um, takes a different approach and uh, continues. So thanks to everyone. Uh, time is nearly up. Great to see 16 comments coming through there and climbing. Uh, it was awesome to see so many people participate today. Thank you again. A special shout out from me as Chief Executive of the External Reporting Board uh, to our Chair, Michelle Embling, for all the um, leadership that she's shown at the board and especially to the climate team for um, producing this very accessible and digestible work. We look forward to your feedback on it. It is mission critical and we look forward to hearing and engaging with you. Thank you, everyone. Back to you, Amelia. Thank you again, everyone. Encourage you to go to our website, download the consultation documents, have a look and get in touch. We're really looking to participate, your participation in this process. Thank you again. Matiwa.